Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. A modified Widman flap will be demonstrated for this 50-year-old male patient who is in excellent systemic health. His teeth about one month ago, and he is maintaining acceptable oral hygiene. The surgery will be performed on the anterior teeth of the patient's maxillary right quadrant, incisors, cuspid, and bicuspids. The interproximal pockets range in depth from 5 to 9 millimeters, while the facial gingival crevices are shallow. In spite of the previous scaling and root planing, the gingival tissues are still inflamed and bleed easily upon probing. At the mesial aspect of the second bicuspid, there is a 9 millimeter pocket. The palatal pockets are from 5 to 8 millimeters deep. Radiographs of the maxillary right quadrant show advanced horizontal bone loss in the anterior region and a lack of lamina dura over the interproximal alveolar crest. At the mesial aspect of the second bicuspid, there is an intrabony defect. The operative site is isolated with sterile gauze sponges. Iodine lotion is applied with a blunt needle syringe to reduce the bacterial flora. This disinfecting solution is introduced into the periodontal pockets. Also, the iodine lotion is applied over the alveolar and palatal mucosa. Prior to the initial incision, the periodontal pockets are surveyed, so the operator will have an accurate image of their depth and topography. The initial incision is started close to the free gingival margin. The blade of the scalpel is directed parallel to the long axis of the teeth. A Bard Parker number 11 blade is suitable for this procedure in this part of the mouth. Part of the interproximal papilla is included with the flap to facilitate adaptation into the interproximal space at the time of post-operative suturing. Where the gingival crevice is shallow, as on the buckle of the cuspid, this initial incision is made intracavicular from the bottom of the crevice. This initial incision should separate the epithelial lining of the gingival crevice from the flap. Subsequent removal of this epithelial lining will enhance the reattachment of the flap following the surgery. The path of the initial incision is retraced with the same instrument in order to ensure that the incision extends to the alveolar process. With a Bennett elevator, a mucoperiosteal flap is raised. This flap should be elevated only two or three millimeters away from the teeth. If the initial incision did not completely separate the soft tissue flap from the bone, the incision can be retraced with a knife. In the palatal area, the initial incision is started with a Bard Parker number 12B blade. This incision should start close to the free gingival margin. 
it should be parallel to the long axis of the teeth and extend down to the alveolar process. An Orban knife may be used if good access cannot be gained with the number 12B blade. Palatal scalloping is accomplished about one half millimeter to one millimeter away from the teeth in order to get good flap adaptation after the surgery. For the palatal aspect of the anterior teeth, the Bard Parker number 11 blade provides good access. A palatal mucoperiosteal flap is raised with a Bennett elevator. This flap should be elevated only two or three millimeters away from the teeth to gain access to the root surfaces of the teeth and to the interproximal spaces. The angular end of the Bennett elevator allows better access to the palatal flap than a straight-ended elevator. A second incision is made along the root surfaces of the teeth, starting from the bottom of the gingival crevice and extending to the alveolar process. A Bard Parker number 11 knife is suitable for this purpose. The root surfaces should not be scratched. Also, a similar second incision is made along the palatal surfaces of the teeth. Next, a third incision is made to free the collar of gingival tissue away from the alveolar process. This is accomplished by using a small interproximal knife or a narrow Orban knife that has been sharpened to form a spear-shaped blade. This incision should dissect the gingival tissue away from the bone so it becomes loose. The operator manipulates the knife blade very carefully so it does not nick the interproximal surfaces of the teeth. On the palatal aspect, a similar incision is made to free the cravicular tissue from the bone. The collar of tissue which has been loosened from the bone is removed with curettes. This is done first on the buccal and interproximal aspects. It is important that the dissected tissues be removed thoroughly. The procedure is repeated on the palatal aspect. When this tissue removal has been completed, the flap is deflected and the operative field is irrigated with sterile saline solution. A thorough root planing of the exposed parts of the root surfaces is performed. Where the roots are covered with fiber attachments close to the alveolar process, curatage and root planing is avoided. Healing takes place more readily to the old fiber attachment than to a newly curated and planed tooth surface. Similarly, root planing is performed from the palatal side. This root planing must be thorough. Otherwise, remnants of the dental pellicle or contaminated cementum could prevent reattachment. The buccal and palatal flaps are approximated manually. In the incisor region, a bony ledge on the labial aspect of the alveolar process prevents good adaptation of the flap. This ledge is reduced slightly with a curette or a chisel to provide better flap adaptation facially and interproximally. The flaps are held in position with sterile gauze sponges moistened in saline solution. This is done for a few minutes prior to suturing. Figure eight sutures are placed using an atraumatic needle and four-aught silk suture. 
The sutures will be tied on the buckle side. This interrupted interproximal suturing holds the buckle and the palatal flaps together in interproximal contact and secures close adaptation to the tooth surfaces. 3% acromycin ointment is placed over the sutures and over the areas of surgery. This ointment serves to prevent infection through the sutures and along the margins of the wounds. A periodontal dressing is placed to cover the entire area of surgery. This dressing holds the flaps in firm contact with underlying bone. Since the flaps were raised for only a short distance, the palatal dressing need not cover a wide area. The occlusion is observed to be certain that the dressing does not interfere with occlusal function. One week after surgery, the periodontal dressing is removed. This is accomplished by breaking the dressing away from the wound surface in order to avoid injury to the healing tissues. The acromycin ointment has prevented the sutures from adhering to the dressing. The area of the surgery is irrigated with warm water or saline solution. The sutures are removed. The excellent healing can be observed. The teeth are polished with a fine polishing paste and a rubber cup. The interproximal areas are polished with dental tape and pumice. To maintain his oral hygiene, the patient is instructed in the correct usage of a soft toothbrush with a circular scrub method, as well as the proper use of dental floss. Six months after the periodontal surgery, the gingival tissues are healthy. The gingival sulci are shallow, and there is no bleeding upon probing. At the mesial aspect of the second bicuspid, the gingival crevice is four millimeters deep. On the palatal aspect, the gingival crevice is from two to three millimeters. There has been some regeneration of the interdental papillae, but they do not completely fill the open interproximal spaces. Post-operative radiographs of the operative site made six months after surgery show a well-defined lamina dura over the alveolar crest in the entire area. The modified Widman flap procedure has successfully achieved periodontal health in the area of surgery for this patient. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.